Welcome everyone to SEO Office Hours. My name is Michael Chidsey. I'm an SEO here at Good Signals. And part of what we do along with special guests are these Office Hours sessions where people can jump in and ask their questions around their website and web search. By the way, nobody here is in the hot seat and we might not know all the answers, but multiple guests thinking about a problem should help. We have a bunch of questions submitted already, as you can see, but if there's anybody here on the call that would like to ask questions, please do just flag yourself in the chat functionality, which will be monitored, and we will prioritise you. Also, please do continue sharing your perspectives. I think that's one of the best things about SEO Office Hours, and Joe will be monitoring, and she will be summarising, and so on. Yeah, we usually have a bunch of SEOs on the call, and to be honest, everybody could be a special guest on the call. Yeah, please do continue doing that. Like every week with me today is Joe Juliana Turnbull, also known as SEO Joe Blogs. Morning. Hello, Mike. Hello, everyone. Really looking forward to this week's SEO office hours. I know I say this every week, but particularly <laughs> looking forward to this week. As Mike said, I'm Joe Juliana Turnbull. I run a remote digital consultancy business helping clients improve their organic and social visibility. We have an office here in Barcelona and in Brisbane. And I'm also the founder of a networking group called Search Barcelona. And I've run Search on it. And this past Monday, we turned 13 years young. And really happy to have had some of the attendees here on the call today that were there. So Rejoice was here, Mike as well and a few more people joining us later. And last week, we actually had guests dialing in from 15 different places. So please do write in the chat where you're calling from. We had a very international SEO off as ours. Very big welcome to everyone joining us live. We have Ruth dialing in from uh, Brisbane, Sandeep. Simon, I think Simon is from Lingfield, UK. Johnny's coming in from Scotland. I think Sandeep said he was in dialing from India, but I can't remember the the city, Eugenie, we have Neil, we have Anatolia, we have Asan, and a couple others. So please do write in the chat where you are dialing in from today. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. And also those that are watching afterwards, if you haven't enjoyed the show, click a like on the YouTube channel, subscribe and like the video. So today, really happy to have Rejoice and Roxana with us. Rejoice is an SEO manager and she's a co-founder of an organization called Be Digital UK. She's been in the industry since 2018 and actually she's an award-winning diversity and inclusion advocate. She's been doing quite a lot in the industry since she's joined us in 2018 and she's also going to be at Brighton SEO. So do connect with her there. She's also a judge for the Global Social Media Awards and the European Search Awards in 2024. So very busy. And Roxana, she is the head of SEO at, uh, and search at a company called Alame. She specializes in technical and image SEO for enterprise websites. And she's also been speaking at other events such as Brighton SEO and WTS Fest. And she's actually speaking at the Amsterdam Friends of Search at the end of March. And another point about Rejoice, she's spoken at Search London last year at their birthday party, and both Roxana and Rejoice took part in my initiative called Turn Digi, which is an online event that I ran in the pandemic. So thank you very much, Roxana and Rejoice, for being here today. I'm going to share your LinkedIn profiles in the chat. Thank you too, Juliana. Thank you for having me. So back over to you, Mike. Great. Let's get going. Um, cool. So we're going to start with a regular question that we always have, which is, uh, what are you most excited about in terms of SEO at the moment? Who would like to kick off? I don't mind. Go for it, Rejoice. Um, I think what I'm most excited about, I think, is how SEO is changing and it's going into more other strategies to do with digital marketing. So when I first started, SEO was sat on its own silo. So you only had the SEO team only fed into the SEO team and website. But now I'm seeing SEO go into brand strategy is going into social media because we have TikTok SEO now. So I think the beauty is how search is evolving and it now allows for more creativity in the space than what we used to have before. So that's what I'm mostly getting really excited about because it means more content. Amazing. And Roxana, what about you? What are you most excited about at the moment? I'm going to continue where Rejoice left off because I always like to do SEO, but then take it a step further and see how it integrates with other channels in the business, specifically with e-commerce, because that's where I'm at now. But 
just seeing a, a bigger trend in, in transferable SEO skills to other areas. So for instance, I also oversee our internal website search where I have my own search engine to play with ranking factors in different things. And all this knowledge, all this reading about Google and patents and trying to understand how it works, it actually is transferable to a website search engine as well. So that's one, one other point of interest for me currently, and also the evolution of AI and how it's going to impact SEO. My boss keeps talking about this thing called AIO, AI optimization with the generative search experience. Yeah, I know <laughs> I, that was my face as well, but <laughs> with Google wants to introduce this in their search, Bing has already done it. We've probably played with Brave and Leo and it, it's just changing how people search. It's still search. So it's probably probably still going to be something that SEOs are interesting in optimizing is just a bit different. I'm all about that now and trying to understand how this will impact what we used to do and how the new normal will look like in six months. Great. And Joe, this is, we have to try and come up with something every week because this is a regular question. Is there anything else that you're excited about? <laughs> I'm still excited about the events and the webinars because there's always so much. And a lot of people do this in their free time too, or um, maybe they've done it in their free time and now they do it as part of a, a paid job. So yesterday, last night, there was the pause, SEO pause for charity last night. As I mentioned in the chat, they this is run by Anton from Duda. And they already had actually over 1,200 views, probably more, over 100 likes on the video. And they've raised over $1,200 for a very good cause. So that was a great event. They had many people dialing in and speakers as well from all over the world sharing their tips and advice. And also, I have really been liking the um, Practical Marketer, although I must say I didn't watch it this week yet, just because I didn't. There's lots of things happening in the world. <laughs> and Shima is running this uh, series called the Practical Marketer. And this week, she ran one for... It's about seven ways to make chat GPT the greatest, the, the world's great writing assistant. So I'll share that in the chat. That was, that's on demand. So you just sign up, it's free, and then you can see it. Looks really good. I will be doing that this weekend. Just share that in the chat there. And sorry, just about the pause, SEO pause for charity last night. Steve, thanks very much. About 5,500 total raised last night, including sponsors. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. Yeah, so that was a, a fantastic event. And then also, I also want to be really happy that Search London had a great turnout on Monday. We had InLinks as the headline sponsor. We had Turn Global as a cake sponsor and Good Signals as a cake sponsor. We had loads of cake and pizza. We had like quite a lot left over. Obviously, in London, there's lots of homeless people, so it all went to them afterwards. And we're looking to do partnerships actually with companies going forward so that they can sponsors for 12 months and then they can be have their promotion over the 12 months. And then it's they can sponsor at least one online event and one in-person event so that everyone can come to Search London. It doesn't need to be physically there. Yeah, lots really happening in, in the industry. Great. I went to both Pause and Search London this week and it's really, both really good. And I've watched the practical webinar series, the marketer series by Chima and Moz, and it, it, they are so good. Particularly, I, ha I haven't also seen this week's yet because that was on Wednesday, but I last week's about LLM by Caitlin. Oh, I can't remember Caitlin's surname. Hathaway, Caitlin Hathaway. Yeah. Oh my God, it was so good. So if you get a chance to watch that, it's, yeah, it's really good. Okay, let's, let's dive into the questions. Thank you to those that have submitted questions. First question is... Our website doesn't serve 404 error pages, but instead redirects to the closest subfolder in the URL structure. Is this correct or could this be an issue? Technical question to begin with, who would like to kick off? I'd like to take that if that's Go okay. Great, Roxana. Great. I like to think about things from a user point of view, because that's what we're being told all the time. So if there's a page, let's say it has a product name, a person still finds it somewhere, clicks on it, expecting to find that product. And then that page is a 404 and they get the category of that product instead. That might be relevant if that category showcases similar products or related products. So still somewhat fulfills the user's intent. But if your 404 page is for a product you don't sell at all, you redirected a folder up, but it's, it's, you can't really find anything related that would fulfill that user journey, 
then I'd say just leave it as a 404. It's fine. It's fine to have pages that don't exist anymore. So I don't want to use that dreaded phrase that it depends, but it does um, on each situation. So always try to think, how will a user find us? Is it still useful? Then yes, do a redirect to somewhere useful and related. But if you think it's not useful, just let it be a 404. Great answer. Rejoice or Joe, do you have anything to add to that? I think just piggybacking off what Roxana said from a user perspective, I think people always think that 404 on pages is the death of your traffic on your site. And usually it isn't. So if, for example, that resource is missing, I think it's fine to alert that the resource is, um, is missing to the user because then they would be much aware. If you set it automatically, I, I think it doesn't necessarily work as well if you put it to into the subfolder so it is about case by case basis but mostly consider how your user will interact with that page um, and what is the best case scenario for that page rather than having a uh, you know rule of thumb to take everything to the subfolder because that can actually be a disadvantage for your own rankings and for your own traffic in in total great joe do, do you have anything to add I think those are two great answers. I don't have anything to add. I just have a comment from the chat. So Eugenia was saying that it would be even better to mark it as 410 so Googlebot knows that the page is gone forever and won't be live anytime soon. Yeah, I, th I think um, with, with something like this, I agree with both answers. And I think these kind of blanket redirects, it, you could end up sending people to people and, and search engines to totally the wrong pages if it's a huge website. So I think I'd probably also take that into account as well, just like the size of the site itself. If, you, if it's a tiny website, uh, chances are you'd probably redirect the any blog post to the blog if it doesn't exist anymore because you don't have category pages and stuff like that. But ideally, it would be a bit more personalized and tailored to that. And for a huge website, I think that's that there's a good chance that there's going to be a big percentage that's probably going to redirect to somewhere that you wouldn't do if you were doing it manually. Yeah. Uh, I, oh, sorry. Go go for it. No, I was just going to say, and just on so Eugene's point, I think the 410 for the pages, it's really if that product no longer exists or you've actually changed it completely and it's not relevant for any part of the site, then I would do the 410. Yeah, so just on that with the 410, what about if there's links pointing to that page, for example? Would you still recommend a 410? So if there's, there's links pointing to, yeah, your website, if it's, then you do need to actually, and so unfortunately it is a little bit manual to see, okay, what's relevant and what's not to 410. But if it's something that's out of stock and you're it's a dead page and you don't want it to be indexed anymore, then you should 410. But I think with a lot of these issues around 410s or 404s, we really should analyze actually the site, what we currently have. Why do we get those in the first place? First of all, I don't think we addressed that. Yeah, why are we getting those sort of 404 pages? Address that. And if, as I said, the product's out of stock, then you could 410 it. But obviously, if it's a huge number of pages, you might want to uh, revisit that. So, so we don't have any context for this, so it's not difficult. But Roxana, just out of interest, where you've got a site the size of Alame, which is <laughs> must be huge. Humongous. Um, humongous. Is it possible to personalize redirects for pages that don't exist anymore for, for, for a site that size? It is, but then you also have to consider uh, the amount of effort versus reward. Is it worth doing? Is it worth managing that many redirects and automating that? Or is it just better to say this product is not here? And yeah. for us in our situation, if, if an image doesn't exist anymore in the catalog, that's a clear 410. It's never coming back the same exact image. So it's easy just to have that 404 page. But here's where you can get creative. What do you show on that 404 page and how do you keep the user on your website and not give them like a dead end, right? Yeah. So they can find something that they thought they would find, but then you give them options. You give them other related things or more ways to navigate and find what they do want. For us, it's a search bar. You can find what you want, search again. You might find something else. And when it comes to those kind of links pointing to this, I know from an SEO point of view, we want to save every single backlink. So we do these redirects because even if the page is 404 or 410, it's that, that link power goes into a black hole, right? Unless we put a redirect. But sometimes it's not worth it. You really don't want to have that bad experience of somebody finding that and going somewhere irrelevant because it's just annoying. Yeah. 
it's harder when it's a big website because you're not going to go and talk to millions of people who link to you and say, can you please remove this? So I, my best recommendation would be if it needs to be a 404, just make that page useful so the user can still find what they need in a different way. Yeah, and I've just shared, thank you for that, Roxanne, and I've just actually shared some some creative 404 pages because, yeah, this is some of these are really good, actually, and you can put that and your users will stay engaged with your page. We do have a couple of questions in the chat. So I don't know if you wanted to go with yeah, the next sure. question, Mike, and then- Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll start, we'll go with the next one and then we'll go to this. Okay, so how many times can I use a keyword before it's considered keyword stuffing? Rejoice, I, you look like you got I, a hand up, but you got, yes. got it, go for it. I think the, the issue is in everyone's mind, a lot of people's mind, they think that there is a set amount of keywords you can use or there's a set number of keywords that will be considered keyword stuffing but I think when you're approaching keyword research and keywords as your content you can't necessarily look at how many keywords can I use before it's classified stuffing what you need to focus on is prioritizing the content quality and the user experience over keyword density so a lot of times if you're so reliant on keywords what you're doing is you're interrupting how I guess the natural flow of a content. So you need to aim to create more informative, more engaging content that addresses your user's interest and the target audience. And whilst you're incorporating those keywords strategically, then you can ensure that has a more natural flow within the context of the content. And a better way I think to monitor it is looking at readability of that content. Because once you have that, you can then see, are you overusing certain keywords to the point where it can distract from the overall quality of that content? So it isn't about there's a set number before it's classified as keyword stuffing. It's more about as a consumer and as a reader, do you actually understand the flow of this content? Does it make sense? Um, have you added the keyword strategically? Are you overusing a keyword? Does it read well? Um, that should be the focus over our keyword frequency. Great. Roxana, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I saw that Simon already said pretty much what I wanted to say, which is don't even think of it as keyword. That's such old SEO. I remember a time in my career when we'd, we were able to actually mathematically calculate how many times a word should appear in a given text to outrank a competitor. Those days are long gone that we should be stopped. We shouldn't talk about keywords anymore. It's about topics, Simon said. You, you, we have to understand what is the topic, what's the verbiage expected for users. A lot of the times we use words we find relevant, but that doesn't mean our users will find them relevant as well. So in, in keyword research, if uh, we still want to call that, it should become topical. It should become about what kind of questions do we want to answer through this content? How do we preempt the intent of the users landing on this page by already giving giving them answers they don't even know they needed until they saw it. And then what are the words we use to do that? And then once we have this kind of keyword universe, let's say, we can then think, is the text clear? Does it read nicely? Is it at the level expected for our users? Or is it the same word every five words or some something like that? Just because an SEO somewhere said, oh, I need this word 10 times in, a, in 10 sentences. So just focus on is the information there is it using the right language that people can understand and relate to and is it clear and then you will find that your keywords in there will be naturally spread anyway so you don't even have to think about it yeah, i think just just adding the topics i think absolutely viewing it as more topical than, than keywords really does set your content apart from the rest because from there you can cluster those topics and then you have more of a breadth of topics to work from that yeah. sort of interlinks and I think how Google looks at content is essentially the flow how are they related together because what you're doing is you're building out uh, a, a good set of discussion points that your users can actually read and in I guess, satisfy your intent, as Roxana said. So it's really key to not be too focused on keywords. It's great to have, but I think if we are so reliant on where can we put keywords, what can we do with keywords, you lose the whole point of quality content and you deviate from what you should do for your users. 
And if yeah. I can also add, sorry, people are starting to learn how to search in a different way. It used to be keyword based where they would just go exactly for what they're looking for. But because of the emergence of AI, searches will become more descriptive. So keyword based will slowly die. So we need to adapt as quick as possible and know this is coming and have our text ready for that. Yeah, I, I, these are all great answers. I just wanted to also clarify what the definition of keyword stuffing is, because sometimes I find that people get concerned about a Pacific, what used to be what we'd ad adhere to back in the day, but we forget actually what it is. So keyword stuffing really is the excessive use of a target keyword in on-page content with the intention of ranking for that keyword. So we know that we can't just be ranking for one specific keyword by simply writing that keyword many times within the body copy. So that's something that we don't do anymore. And as both Rejoice and Roxana said, it really is about topics. Topics, so we've also talked about having pillar pages and then topic clusters. It's about executing that for a website. And I just have a couple of comments in the chat. Thanks, Monty, for sharing your site about keyword stuffing. Totally fine to share that. Not a shameless plug. We've also had from comments. Can from I just add that's a blog post? It's not that <laughs> Monty keyword stuff. Of, here's my, here's oh, my, no, sorry. I've, she's written. I've keyword stuffed it <laughs> and it works. It's not that. <laughs> sorry. She's written a blog post about it. Thank you very much. And also, yeah, thanks, Eugenie. Yeah, uh, use synonyms. You're talking about using synonyms and real and places. That's a great. And yeah, Hassan was saying about, yeah, if you're, yeah, your content should not be stuffed with key, keywords because it could be harming your user game, engagement. It could also affect your, your SEO. So focus on creating the engaging content rather than keyword stuffing. Okay, yeah, great. Lots of chat images, lots of questions and comments in the chat. There's, a, there's actually a good question in there asking if we don't know our keywords, we go generic with topics that can include a multitude of things. How do we measure keyword ranking then? And it's a very good question because it used to be the basis of our SEO success for the longest time. And now I'm saying, mm -hmm. don't do that, right? Which is why, mm -hmm. <laughs> what do I do then? But let's do an imagination exercise. You go from a website where you have a hundred keywords that you're uh, continuously monitoring and you go to a website as big as the one I'm working on, where you literally rank for anything under the sun and monitoring keywords is impossible on a per keyword basis. Yeah. So then you realize keywords lose importance. They have so many variations. You can have one topic with hundreds of keywords going for the same one thing because of variations, because they become more and more descriptive and more long tail. So it's harder to get rankings for that. So I think we, we should move away from rankings, especially since the SERPs have changed so much. You get all these uh, snippets and features, you get the impressions, but you don't actually get the clicks. I rank first, but I don't drive traffic. So then it's not even relevant to look at rank in that case, right? Yeah. So I think we need to take it a step further and forget about ranking and start looking at, are we actually driving people to our website? And that should be the new measure of, are my keywords working? Yeah, I think that's absolutely correct. Because now how I look at keyword research in, in general is not necessarily focusing on the keywords per se. I just need to know what is driving traffic to the site and what actually is from a metric perspective, whether I'm looking for conversions, whether I'm looking for clicks, I need to focus on what is actually giving me that. And sometimes you might find that it could be a, a keyword that you probably wasn't even trying to <laughs> rank for per se, and that's what has been attached. So it is about, again, the, the quality of the content. It is about serving user intent. And once you serve that, that you would then see the traffic to your site. But if you're so focused on, I need to be first, I need to be on the first page, there's lots of websites, as Roxana said, that's on the first page, but it doesn't actually generate traffic. It doesn't lead um, anywhere or lead to conversion. So I don't necessarily think rankings should be the first and most important metric. You can consider it, but look at the landscape of what you have what is actually giving you that return on investment from a search perspective and then strategize from there. Great answers. And I'd also say as well, look and see some of the keywords that are, so look and see the traffic, traffic. and the conversions to, to that page, because we had part of that question was also 
if you're how, how you know what position you are and if you don't have a keyword for that, that service page but what you should do is also look at your traffic and your conversions to that page and also don't forget google search console too it does take sample data you can have a look at what are the queries that people are searching for so you're not just going to focus on one query look at overall the queries the impressions and the clicks i look at that that's underutilized sometimes Okay. I'm just going to add with that, I thought everybody's answers were amazing. And if it's a smaller website, the only thing I would add, a little trick, if you're trying to work out, basically, maybe there's somebody above you, maybe a boss or something like that. And they think, because maybe they worked in SEO a bit a long time ago, that they think you need to cover the page that you're working on in terms of your keywords and so on. A trick that I have is removing that and creating a version of the page that you think. So let's imagine like it's, I don't know, Wedding Planner Birmingham or something like that. And just going to the coffee shop or something like that and just buying some people in the queue a coffee, showing them the page and taking it away and asking them what the page is about. And if you get enough people saying roughly top of that, it's somebody that organizes weddings in Birmingham or wedding planning Birmingham or whatever. And guess what? You've only got it mentioned somewhere once or not even at all. I I, I think that's a pretty good indicator as well. Um, it's a little bit scrappy and it's more for kind of smaller websites, but um yeah, just if you're trying to persuade somebody, that could be a way. I can't yeah, believe you've taken user testing to the streets, Michael. I'm a, I, I'm also a CRO at heart, and I do a lot of user testing. And that's I'm very much a get in front of real people, and I and that's the way Google's going, and the way it's been going for a long time. I when I can't persuade somebody by myself, then I go and get <laughs> either thousands of people online to help me prove something, or I'll or I'll go to the local coffee shop. I've spent many days on Carnaby Street with iPads going, sorry, can I just grab you for a moment? And would you like a chocolate? <laughs> well, that, that sounds a bit odd, but it's for user testing. <laughs> Great. Joe, you mentioned there are questions in the chat and we've also got questions here. So do you want to? Yeah. Yeah. So just another question. So just on this one to wrap up this and could we could talk about this for ages. I just want to emphasize the fact that using the keywords in the right way, it does mean you are writing quality content you're researching it you're looking at like the main topics and then the subtopics so yes it is still important to use them chris is saying think about the placement of the keywords in the systematic structure rather than the amount if you're worrying about using a keyword too much yeah so just basically think about more about where you're placing it rather than oh i need to have it x amount of times within the content so thank you everyone for your comments about our keyword question I also have another question here regarding Google Business Profile, which is now called, do you think optimizing Google Business Profile should be part of an SEO strategy? I would say yes, if it is a brick and mortar store or and if you actually serve customers within your at your office, if you meet them. I do think that you actually need to allocate resource to that because a lot of times people don't allocate that and they just want, oh, I want to improve my traffic, but they don't actually want to allocate the budget. I'll pass over to Rejoice because she is nodding lots. Uh, what do you think about this? Should you have a Google, optimizing a Google business profile, should they be part of an SEO strategy? I think absolutely if you're if you know you do have a business that either has physical locations in in different areas whether that's in the UK and if it's a brick and mortar yeah brick and mortar location and the reason why I say that is because you can actually it can help you drive the tra relevant traffic to your site and as well as being found quite easily a lot of people think that Google business profile sits in its in its own remit but you can actually include that because a lot of the different aspects within Google Business Profile, in my head, kind of acts as the same. So when you have to add the name, your address, and you can optimize things such as the description within Google Business Profile, and you can use contextualized keywords to, to enhance it, because Google does read reviews. And when I was working with a client and I had to optimize the 700 and something stores <laughs> on <laughs> the UK. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it was really important for us to understand the landscape of why is this important for the business? And because they are an e-commerce brands, they have physical stores you go in, we have to think about different aspects of what, based on competitors who are getting the flow of traffic and who are getting contacted, even down to things as imagery, for example, mm. adding that imagery to your Google business profile is very much key. So if that's an important aspect of your business in the physical store, 
you should add it to your strategy. If you don't have it, then there's no point including it. But if you do consider that and allocate resources, because that audit is really important to do on Google Business Profile. So I will always you know, go for it. Joyce, well, thank you. That is 700 plus. How do you optimize 700 plus profiles? That is nuts. A lot, get, a, get a big team. <laughs> a lot of bulk uploads. And sometimes you will do the bulk uploads and it wouldn't go through because it's a slight error. It was so much fun because it's like you're trying to work it out. But I think at the same time, it, it took a lot of work. Yeah, so get a big mm. team. Thank you. That was loads. Uh, Roxana, do you have anything else to add to that? Uh, yeah, I'm going to tie it back to AI. I'm going to bore everybody with that. <laughs> but with generative search experience, branding is becoming a more and more important thing. Mm. Not that it wasn't really important before. But if the AI doesn't know about you as a brand, you're probably not going to show up in its answers and you do want to be in there and you, you do want that kind of advertising. So having a business profile just gives you another option to link to from your organization schema and make your knowledge graph a bit stronger when it comes to what your brand is and how you define it for search engines, but also for AI bots that are crawling all of this information. So I'd suggest, as Rejoy said, make sure you have a very nice business profile, but also use it in your organization schema in the um, same as property. Thank you. Amazing. Joe, do you have anything to add? No, that's all really from this one. That was really in-depth answers. Yeah. Thank you. But also to people that are watching us from not live. I just wanted to say thank you for joining us and do click a like to our video and subscribe to the YouTube channel. And of course, join SEO office hours by signing up. I'll share a link and it'll be in the description as well so that you can join us live next time every Friday at 9.30 GMT. Good job. Amazing. Okay, ne next question. <laughs> as a travel writer affected by the helpful content update, I'm aiming to boost my website's authenticity by replacing generic stock images with unique images, either personally taken or acquired through exclusive partners. How does Google verify the ownership and relevance of the original and of the original image? Can I take this one? Because yes, I, I, I heard I really stock, hope stock images are a problem <laughs> and that just hurts me personally. Let, let, let me take a step back and get out of my own personal opinion here. Helpful content update. Yeah. If we try to consider what that is about, it, it's about content that doesn't meet the criteria needed for users to be considered helpful. And that content has various elements where stock photos could be one of them. But as I said, it's one of them. It's not all of them. So if we were to think, is this a problem with all stock photos everywhere? No. If you're writing about your own experience in Rome, let's say, yeah, traveling there, but you use generic photos that everybody has used, how is your content trustworthy by users? Because if it's your own experience, then you have your own photos. Right. But if you're, let's say, writing a guide about best places to see in Rome and you want pictures of the Trevi fountain without all the tourists around, then you can use a stock photo to show the fountain. And that's absolutely fine because it still meets the purpose. So I would say not stock photos got you in trouble or not just stock photos alone. It's in combination with how you present your content. And if you present it as first person using somebody else's images, it's not trustworthy. So have a look at all of your content and how does it present? If you were not the one writing it, would you actually trust that information? Or would you think, oh, somebody just used some AI to write 500 words on this and then somebody else slapped an image on it? So I'd say don't just change images and expect that to work because you might actually have to take a lot of pictures and it's not going to change the outcome. Great answer. Rejoice or Joe, do you have anything to add? Not much to add because I think Xena is a lot more versed in imagery because I hardly work with images. But I, I would, yeah, I would say that when you're looking at how Google authenticity of original images, all the points that Roxana uh, mentioned are relevant. And I think furthermore, adding more unique captions is what I've read about and what has helped with clients is adding those unique captions with the images and descriptions to provide more context to search engines. A lot of times people forget about those um, contexts for for search engines and just think, oh, Google will know what the image looks like and Google doesn't. So that can be a, a way for you to take a step further and help Google 
um, verify that, that this is more authentic um, than, than other images as well. Great. I see. I, I always think with, sorry, Joe, I, just, <laughs> I, I always think with something like this, that if I was in this situation, I would be thinking how much time and thought did I put into image research in the first place? If it is a stock image, I would just be thinking, have I just picked the very first thing that I Googled or looked for on one of the stock libraries? Or have I actually spent some time trying to find something that's really relevant to what's there on the page in terms of content and what you're writing about? And if it is the first where it's very much, yeah, just grab whatever and I haven't really thought about images, then th that's when I would worry. But if I have taken that time to actually do a load of image research and find the right content for your content, then, then I wouldn't worry as much. And yeah, I don't see that being a problem. Joe, sorry, I interrupted you. No, it's fine. It's really hard to if people are talking. So I just wanted to say outside of Google, yeah, if you are a travel writer and Roxana pointed onto this and I myself, I've done a lot of traveling, fortunate to be doing, uh, to have done a lot of traveling. I like to use my own photos in, in the places that I've visited, especially I'm, if I'm a travel writer, I can say, oh, this is the photo that I've done. This is you because you can be taking uh, unique photos. And also what we haven't covered on here is just to make sure that your text, your images have descriptive alt text, because for those that are visually impaired, they cannot read the images. Their screen reader cannot read the images. So make sure that all of your texts, sorry, all of your images have descriptive alt text describing that image. And there's just a couple of things in the chat as well. Just, yeah, oh, Chris, when naming an alt text of images, they should be considered. When naming uh, an image, yes, make sure that it's descriptive alt text because obviously people that cannot see the image. And thank you, Roxana, for sharing that 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 link on Search Engine Journal. Yep, that's it. Back to you, Mike. Just on the travel image situation, though, obviously, if you're traveling around and you're there, say some, you're somewhere like New York City and you want to capture a photo in Central Park, but it happens to be a really cloudy, horrible day and so on. That's a bit like Roxana was saying around having lots of people there and you just want a photo of the fountain. It just, make, it just does make total sense if, if that's part of the content, doesn't it, to use stock imagery. Great, okay, ne next question that we have is, no matter how many times we explain, the senior leadership team and everybody else still don't understand what we do. It's important too, since we're all about bringing in warm leads with SEO, but there seems to be, but, but they seem to think we're just updating the website or not doing much on so social media, which to be fair is true because that's not how we get those leads. Thoughts? Joe, you put your hand. Go. Yeah, I just want to say to be really concise answer, try, if you can, sign up to the SEO MBA course by Tom Critchlow, because that really helps you to sell in or to show SEO to the board of directors. It's really good. And Roxana, thank you. You've just shared that in the chat. I was Googling, as you said, how do you talk to C-levels? I'm like Googling, oh, this is the newsletter for everybody. <laughs> this has been a problem for years until I finally understood where I was going wrong. That's the problem. We always think it's them. It's not us. I'm such a professional. I know everything about SEO. I'm so technical. Why don't they believe me and just do it? That's the problem, right? We're very focused on what we know and we don't make it, we don't put it in the context of what they know. And here's where we go wrong. And we go very technical to show how good we are and mm. they don't understand the thing and they don't want to deal with it. That's what happens. And that's what happened to me at least for years until I realized I was going wrong. I am the one that needs to make a change. And I'm not saying I got the perfect formula. I'm far from it. I'm still working and refining. So I'll take tips from anybody who's figured it out. But I think that's where you have to start. Understand what are the metrics these people actually care about because they're not going to be crawl levels, indexation, uh, keyword ranking. They do not care about that. They don't know what it is. They don't want to know what it is. These people have immense pressure on them to deliver ROI. That's the main thing they care about. Learn how they measure ROI for different companies. It might be different things. It might be actual revenue. It might be sales. It might be leads whatever it might be, learn what those main metrics are and then learn how do you tie your work in SEO and especially if it's technical, 
How do you tie it to that ROI? Once you can bring these two together, you will find something they want to listen to. So if you go and say, oh, I can increase indexation by this much, I can get this much more traffic, and then 10 more keywords will rank page one, snooze fest. If you tell them, I can do some stuff, I can show you what, but the end result of this will be a 3% increase here on your target, they will be like, let's discuss it. What do you need? How do you do it? So that's, flip it over. That's a very good answer. I also just also wanted to say what I've noticed is that people will never ask you, what, can you explain that to me? Because nobody likes to ask that question. It seems like the C-levels don't want to, they, they may probably don't have time, but they also don't look stupid. So they'll never ask you, oh, I don't understand. Can you go into that in more detail? So it's really important just to keep it simple. And, and it's what, different mindsets, right? We yeah. work with a detailed <clears throat> picture. That's our job. We need to know the details, how they connect, how it all works. They're at a level where they need to think about the big picture and the future. They don't need that detail. Maybe that's why they don't ask. It's too much for them. They don't need it. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with what Joe and Roxana said. I think that communicating SEO value to senior leadership has always been a difficult task because it does require you to demonstrate the impact on the business objective and the ROI, as Roxana said. But I think sometimes the missing element is the educational aspect. When we're educating senior leadership by SEO, we do talk too much about the details that are so irrelevant, but I think from a senior leadership, they just want to see how SEO provides value to the overall picture. So maybe talk about and explain and demonstrate how SEO can feed into other aspects. So in my current role, I speak about how SEO can feed into new business, how it can feed into client service team, how it can feed into social media, digital PR, because in that way, they can now understand what SEO is and how it looks because then that sort of adds to the ROI, the investment, the sales, the revenue, and so on. And I think if you're able to structure it in that way, they will start to get it, quote unquote. But if you are too focused on, we're going to increase your clicks by 5%, they're not going to get that. Great. Thank you. Loads of answers. Yeah, amazing answers. So the question, so you had the senior leadership team, but it also said everybody else as well. And I, at, at one point for 11 years, not just one point, I was the marketing director of an events company and SEO was a big point of what we did. And I saw, I, I used to have it where in the pub on a Friday, you'd have people from across the company asking about what we actually do. And I saw that as a, a really good opportunity to create champions across the company. And actually what Rejoice was saying then about educating, but also what Roxana was saying about not being too complicated with it, not talking, oh, Gemini and core updates and stuff like that, but actually explaining how that impacts their job and, and so on. And I purposely tended to focus on maybe a, a few things like the shinier things that people could then talk about. For example, any interesting or creative link building campaigns we were working on that were getting coverage in trade publications or in nationals, or it might be that we've just done a blog post or a guide or something that's brought in a load of new traffic and therefore inquiries. And so I would try and find a few things like that to help explain. Obviously in the pubs, probably not the best time, but that's when when people tend to mingle. And, and I yeah, I think having those champions in different teams just saying, oh, it's really cool what they're doing over there in, in, in digital marketing or in SEO. Thankfully in that role, the CEO and the MD, they, they did really understand the impact on the business. But hopefully the graphs and everything that you're working on and the increase in inquiries, whatever it is also a good indicator. Yeah, we have a lot of you go on. Oh no, I was just gonna say you just have a lot of links in the chat. Thanks, Roxana, for sharing that. Yeah. You made a very good point about finding your champions. Not everybody is suited to understand the business side of things immediately, right? But by finding these champions, you can have somebody who fights that fight for you so you don't have to learn all of those things. I'm doing a financial course because I talk to my financial director and don't understand half of the things she says, but I know they're important, right? So you find somebody who can translate those things for you or who can take your ideas and translate them into business um, outcomes to the other people. So find who are your champions, who are the people who know what you're doing is right and will have a good outcome and make sure you're always in contact with those people. You keep them updated. You explain to them as well as you can what the outcome you think it is 
and then give them all the tools they need to take that further. In the links I shared, there's a lot of them from the Great Dot Company, Tori and Sam, who are amazing at writing about how do you show value in SEO? Because that's another very hard thing. How do you tie traffic and show how it, you can monetize it in the end? Have a look at their articles. I've also added a link to a presentation I do. It's called the Internet for SEOs. And it talks about how do you show the value of SEO to developers by understanding what developers actually care about. Because even with them, we tend to talk about SEO. They don't know SEO. They did a different course in school than we did, right? We tell them, oh, Core Web Vitals, you have to fix them. They don't know what that is. That's something Google invented a few years ago. They were already working and not paying attention to that because it's not their job. Hmm. Again, understand what they care about and try to translate the SEO tasks into things they know about and care about, and then that will make discussions way easier. Thank you, Roxana. Can you actually just share that in the, I, I saw the great, the great Yeah, it's underneath. It's the last one in the list. Uh, the one shared by, I put Omi Sido's name because he's at all these conferences, getting videos of all these presentations for free and then sharing them with the community. So thank you, Omi, for doing all that work. Great. Thank you, Great Dot and company and Tori and Omi. Yeah, this is great. We have so much resources in the industry. This is why I really like our community because everyone's always hopeful, helpful and, and sharing so if there isn't, if there, if you guys are struggling or you have some questions, I know obviously we have SEO office hours, but make the most of the community that we have. A big shout out to Women in Tech SEO. It's been a fantastic community and is, and it has their, they're having an event next Friday on International Women's Day, the WTS Fest, and Roxana will also be there. I will be there. Uh, so Ruth will be uh, co-presenting instead of me. And uh, yeah, it's been a great community to be able to share and support one another. So if you don't know the answer, or something it's okay it's normal there's not many industries where there's things changing so quickly and we need to do the research before we can find the answer and give the answer to the client and you're more than welcome to submit them to office hours as well obviously that's the whole purpose is to help people who are on their own and like seo might be one of many things that they're doing okay next question what role do social signals play in seo and how can social media be leveraged for better rankings Rejoice, you got your hand up. It's so polite. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we've ever had anybody just put their hand up. That's so nice. <laughs> no, so with social signals like likes, shares and comments and social media platforms, they, so they can have an indirect impact on search engine, on SEO in total. And that impact is essentially it influences factors like your brand visibility, website traffic and user engagement. So while social signals themselves may not directly affect rankings, but they can and contribute to an improved SEO performance in a few ways. So social media platforms can serve as an additional channel for distributing your content, and this will help increase the reach potential for attracting backlinks and so on. But also we have to think about the active engagement aspects on social media, because this also helps you with your brand awareness. It helps you with your credibility. It leads to more branded search terms. And that again, has more direct traffic to your website. So when we speak about social signals, we have to think about is how can this provide more valuable insights into our audiences, social media and social signals does give us really good audience um, preference and their interest. And we could use this to inform our content creation and our SEO strategies, how we look at that on page elements. And we can leverage our social media for better rankings if we want to focus on creating that high quality, shareable content, engaging with your audiences. And that way we are also fostering a really strong social media presence across relevant platforms. So it's not necessarily about thinking about it in a silo, but thinking about it from a helpful content, quality content perspective. So that's how I view social signals in informing the content and the interest of the audience that I'm trying to target. That's great. Branding helps um, with SEO as well, right? The, the the more branded visibility you have, the better your SEO does for some reason, even if it's not coming through branded searches. 
And uh, we've probably all heard about the um, antitrust violation hearings that Google has been in, and that has revealed a few interesting things about Google mm -hmm. that we all believe to be true, but were never confirmed. And I think the biggest one is that click-through rate is actually used in ranking, which we all believed it would influence ranking somehow, but now it's it's been confirmed. So imagine if, if your brand is so well-known and so well-understood by a search engine, and 90% of people searching for your product click on your brand, then new people searching for that product without knowing what brand they want will see your brand as being one of the top um, suggested brands to buy from. Because if so many other users trusted that brand, it means it's good enough for new users who don't yet know what brand they want. So that's where, as Reed said, using social media can make your brand more trustworthy in front of people. And that can, in the end, end up with more clicks for you from organic as well. Yeah, and also with social, Rejoice, these are great answers, by the way, what Rejoice was mentioning about, so the interaction, you can see that a bit easier and a bit quicker, really, with social media. You write a post on Twitter, you write something on, or X, you write a post on uh, LinkedIn, whatever your social media platform that you use, or social media platforms that you use for your company or for you as your brand, you can easily and quickly see where those people are coming from within LinkedIn. You can see how people are interacting with it visually, publicly. So it all helps really to build up your brand. I also just want to quickly say, if we run out of time, thank you everyone for joining us today for SEO office hours. And we look forward to seeing you next week at 9.30 a.m. when my sister Ruth Trumbull, dialing in from Brisbane, will be the co-host. And thank you very much to our speakers, Roxana and Rejoice, and our guests for joining us from all over the world. I can't believe thank you for uh, having us. I can't Pardon? believe because you can't be bothered to be here next week. You've twinned in someone. <laughs> oh, yes, I have twinned in someone. That is so you're like, true. You're like a magician. It's amazing. Where they do that yeah. trick. Like, how did they get from there to there? <laughs> yeah, because there is Ruth. Can anyone see Ruth? Do we look a little bit similar? <laughs> everybody will be able to see Ruth next week it'll be really really good we got four minutes we'll try and fit in just uh, one more okay so how do I modify the pages that show up when somebody googles our brand so I'm assuming they mean in the search results themselves you google say the brand and then you get a selection a handful of pages that appear under say your home page and the person wants to know can I modify this is this the site links that google chooses out of your I, website. I, yes, that's what I, that's how I interpreted the question anyway. Because if it's that, it's a good question. I want to know how, but I think it's related to internal linking. So pages that are more prominently linked on your site will show up in there. That's what I've seen so far, at least. I don't know if it's any other criteria. Yeah, it used to be internal linking and you used to actually be able to remove those site links if you didn't like it. You yeah. weren't able to add it but that's been taken away now. But it actually is based also, I've heard on the yeah, internal linking and the most popular pages that you have. And that would make sense, right? It just gives user shortcuts. Yeah. Yeah. So if so, if, I guess if you're trying to modify that, I guess what one way of doing that is thinking about from a structure and site point of view, how you prioritize pages. But also, like you said, if you've got popular pages, I guess popularity might come from people landing directly on them. But it could also come from if, for instance, there are blog posts and so on showing or product pages, it might be that you're featuring them on the home page and therefore you're kind of showing to, to like crawlers and so on that they're important. Yeah. So if I was going to do that, I would look at the structure and look at the pages that are appearing at the moment and think about am I if Google was a human would they pick pick those going back to my user testing thing there <laughs> thinking from a user perspective yeah great okay i think we'll finish there because we've only got two minutes and we're never going to get through another question in two minutes thank you so much to everybody that joined today um on the live call thank you so much to roxana thank you so much to rejoice and thank you so much to joe joe enjoy women in tech seo event next week i'll be here with joe's sister ruth um Thanks, and ruth hopefully not everybody will be a woman in tech SEO and it won't just be me on my own <laughs> if it is that's fine but cool thank you so much yeah. everybody. thank you everyone thank you thank everybody you. bye